Overview Alex Michaelides' The Silent Patient 2019 is a modern psychological thriller. It's about Alicia, who murdered her husband Gabriel six years ago and hasn't spoken since. The majority of the story is set in the present day, and it is told through the eyes of Theo Faber, a forensic psychologist. He has recently started working with Alicia at The Grove, the mental institution where she has been since Gabriel's death. The epistolary style is employed throughout the work, with extracts from Alicia's old journal, a written narrative from the past that chronicles the weeks leading up to Gabriel's murder, interspersed with Theo's story. These two stories eventually collide in a plot surprise that reveals Theo and Alicia have a shared past that is considerably more intimate than the doctor-patient connection that was initially described. Alex Michaelides is a screenwriter and author of Cypriot Descent. He lives in London, the setting for The Silent Patient. The novel debuted at the top of the New York Times bestseller list shortly after its release. This study guide is based on the Astromare Limited Edition, which was released in 2019. Note, the novel contains themes such as suicide, murder, mental physical abuse, mental illness, and trauma that may be distressing to some readers. The Silent Patient is narrated by forensic psychotherapist Theo Faber, 42, who begins by outlining the major plotline, the mystery of Alicia Berenson. Alicia Berenson is a painter who killed her husband Gabriel Berenson six years ago. She was 33 years old at the time. Gabriel was 44 years old at the time. Alicia was found at the site, having shot Gabriel five times in the head and then slitting her wrists. Since then, Alicia has been silent. A self-portrait she produced and signed with Alcestis is the sole hint as to her state of mind after the murder. She was sent to the Grove, a psychiatric hospital. The story is told partly via Theo's present-day narration and partly through Alicia's old journal, which chronicles the weeks leading up to Gabriel's murder. It's six years after the murder when the story begins. Theo is starting a new job at the Grove, which he applied for just so that he could work with Alicia. For years, Alicia's high-profile case has attracted him. Theo finds Alicia excessively drugged by her primary therapist, Christian West, in his first appointment with her. Theo demands that her dose be reduced in order to connect with Alicia. Alicia is more awake in their next session, and she strikes him violently. Despite Stephanie Clark, the Grove's manager, wanting to end Theo's meetings with Alicia, Lazarus Diomedes, the Grove's clinical director, intervenes and chooses to give Theo six weeks to persuade Alicia to communicate. Theo is dead set on discovering why Alicia murdered Gabriel and why she refuses to stand out. He takes on the role of investigator, interrogating her relatives, neighbors, and friends because he can't speak with her verbally. Barbie Hellman, Alicia's next-door neighbor, informs him that Alicia had a stalker in the weeks leading up to Gabriel's death. Along with narrating his research into Alicia, Theo also shares facts about his own life including a subplot about his wife Catherine or Kathy's adultery. One night, Theo unintentionally finds the affair. For Theo, who has already suffered from mental health issues, the betrayal is devastating, including an unsuccessful suicide attempt. He changes into the stereotypical jealous spouse outside of the grove, incessantly examining Kathy's emails and following her when she sees her lover validate his suspicions. Back at the Grove, Theo discovers that Alicia has used a paintbrush to stab another patient. Alicia's medicine has been restarted, and she has been placed in seclusion by Christian. Lazarus informs Theo that Alicia is no longer available for counseling. Theo makes Alicia a final visit, and she hands over her journal to him. It backs up Barbie's claim that Alicia had a stalker in the weeks leading up to Gabriel's death. Theo learns via Alicia's diary that she informed Gabriel and her therapist about her stalker, who Theo discovers was Christian, collecting off the book's monetary payments in exchange for hidden private therapy. Neither of the men thought she was telling the truth. Christian recommended antipsychotic medicine, which Alicia refused to take for fear of being attacked. Alicia says in her final journal post that her stalker is at home. Theo, 
gives Alicia the diary back. Theo confronts Christian, as well as Alicia's relatives and acquaintances, including her cousin, Paul Rose, and her aunt Lydia, with the discoveries contained in the journal. Through this, Theo deduces that whatever Alicia overheard her father say when she was a kid caused Alicia's psychological death, a pivotal point in her life that resulted in her loathing for her father and, as a result, her ability to kill. Theo feels he knows why Alicia identifies with Alcestis now that he has this knowledge. A guy, like the tragic character, deceived Alicia, valuing another life above her own. He tells Alicia about his notion. Alicia begins to speak and discloses the truth about Gabriel's murder night. Her stalker forced his way in and bound her. When Gabriel returned home, the stalker attacked him, tied him up, shot him six times, and then fled, according to Alicia. However, this tale contradicts the police evidence. Gabriel was shot five times, and Theo is skeptical. Theo comes to the grove the next day, intending to confront Alicia about her betrayal, but when he arrives, he learns that Alicia has overdosed and is in a coma. Theo notifies Lazarus that she suspects someone has given her a deadly amount of morphine on purpose. Lazarus summons the cops and instructs Theo to locate Alicia's journal as proof. Christian is being investigated by the police. In the interim, Theo has disclosed Christian's prior hidden treatment of Alicia. In truth, Theo was the one who gave out the morphine. The plot of Kathy's adultery appears to be taking place in the current day, in the background of Theo's probe into Alicia's silence, according to the narrative up to this point. The subplot of Kathy's affair, however, takes place six years earlier, and the man Kathy was having an affair with was Gabriel, according to the story. In the weeks leading up to the murder, Theo was Alicia's stalker. He tracked Gabriel down to his home, intending to assassinate him. That's where he came upon Alicia. The truth is revealed in Alicia's final journal post, written before the morphine took effect. Theo was her stalker, Alicia guessed as soon as he arrived at the grove. Theo's reaction to her false narrative of the night of the murder confirms Alicia's suspicions. Because she still feels terrible about Gabriel's death, she let Theo give her a deadly dosage. Theo had both Alicia and Gabriel bound, on the night of the murder. Gabriel was then given the option of either dying or letting Alicia die. Theo fired a gun into the air and walked away when Gabriel chose to live. Unbeknownst to him, Theo had reawakened Alicia's anguish of her father wishing she had died instead of her mother. She shot her spouse because she was mentally ill. Theo is unable to locate Alicia's diary and is ignorant that this final entry exists but he praises himself for attempting to heal Alicia, whom he had not intended to become mad and imprisoned. He is offered a position as director of another institution. Kathy is devastated about her lover's death, but neither she nor Theo has acknowledged having an affair. As the police arrive with Alicia's journal, the story comes to a close. Theo recognizes that the moment has come to pay the consequences of his conduct. Alicia's diary, in the end, will uncover the truth and bring Theo to justice. Epigraph But why does she not speak, says the epigraph, a motto or quote that precedes the commencement of a piece of literature. The quotation comes from Euripides' Greek play Alcestis. The play depicts the narrative of King Admetus, who discovers that if he can find someone ready to die in his place, he can live. Alcestis, his wife, accepts to be sacrificed. Alcestis is brought back to life by Heracles. She's alive again, but she doesn't or can't talk. Prologue, Alicia Berenson's Diary The prologue is taken from Alicia Berenson's journal, which was written on July 14, five weeks before Gabriel Berenson was murdered. Alicia has been depressed for a long time. Her emotions have weighed her down so heavily as a painter that she has been unable to produce. Gabriel, a photographer who understands her creative difficulties, encourages her to write and provides her with a journal to keep track of her thoughts. She expresses her affection for Gabriel in her letter. 
Alicia is embarrassed by the idea of maintaining a diary, stating that only Anne Frank and not someone like me would do so. This will be a joyful record of ideas and images that inspire me artistically, things that have a creative impact on me, she vows. I'm just going to write cheerful, typical, good ideas. No outlandish ideas are permitted. Part 1 Chapter 1 Part 1 begins with a quote from Sigmund Freud's Introductory Lectures on Psychoanalysis. He who has eyes and ears to see and hear may persuade himself that no mortal can maintain a secret. If he doesn't speak, he chatters with his fingertips, treachery seeps from every pore in his body. Theo Faber, the novel's first-person narrator, is a 42-year-old London-based forensic psychologist. In Chapter 1, he does not reveal these things or even his name. Instead, he dives right into the day Alicia murdered Gabriel, a case that had piqued his interest for years. Alicia, 33 at the time, assassinated Gabriel on August 25, six years prior. Gabriel, a photographer, returned home late after a Vogue photo session in London's Shoreditch district. Barbie Hellman, a neighbor, heard gunshots and phoned the cops half an hour later. Gabriel's body was discovered on a chair, with wire wrapped around his wrists and ankles. He'd been shot in the face five times. Alicia was standing in the room with serious slashes on both wrists, self-inflicted. She was rushed to the hospital and survived. She didn't say anything else after that. Her lone statement was a self-portrait she painted in the days following her hospital discharge. She signed the canvas, all cestus in the lower corner. Part 1 Chapter 2 Theo notes that all cestus is a Greek mythological heroine, describing her unsettling myth of self-sacrifice as the saddest kind of love story. Theo considers disclosing his identity, still he's a nameless narrator at this point, but instead says, I am not the hero of this story. Because this is Alicia Berenson's narrative, I'll start with her and the Alcestis. Theo recounts Alicia's self-portrait, which depicts her at her painter's studio, standing in front of an easel and a canvas while holding a paintbrush. She is completely undressed. The scars on her wrists are also depicted in the picture. Red paint or blood is flowing from the paintbrush. Alicia's gallery manager, Jean Felix Martin, showed the self-portrait throughout her trial, and people queued outside the door to see it. Alicia stayed mute during the trial. Her silence was seen by the judge as an indication of guilt. The defense emphasized Alicia's early history of mental health issues in entering a plea of diminished responsibility a criminal defense that absolves an accused person of liability for a criminal act by arguing they were mentally impaired. Professor Lazarus Diomedes, clinical director of The Grove, a secure mental health hospital in North London, claimed that Alicia's silence was an indication of severe mental suffering. As a consequence, Alicia was sent to The Grove rather than prison. Six years later, Theo discovers an opening for a forensic psychotherapist at the Grove and applies. Part 1 Chapter 3 My name is Theo Faber, the narrator eventually identifies himself. I'm a 42-year-old woman. And since I was messed up, I became a psychotherapist. Theo grew up with his mother and violent father in Surrey, just outside of London whom Theo now suspects had an undiagnosed personality disorder. He thought he was free when he left home at the age of 18 to attend university. He did, however, suffer from mental health concerns as a result of internalizing his father's abuse. I was pursued by an infernal, relentless chorus of furies, all with his voice, shrieking that I was worthless, shameful, and a failure. He began counseling after an attempted suicide attempt during his first semester. Rush, Theo's therapist, assisted him with talking therapy. Theo wants to work with Alicia, which entails working at the Grove, as a fully qualified and competent psychotherapist. He talks about his interview for a job at the Grove. He doesn't go into detail about why he became a psychotherapist when questioned, his own difficult past. Instead, he tells the interview panel, which is overseen by Indira Sharma, a current Grove employee, that he wants to assist others. 
The task goes to Theo. Part 1 Chapter 4 Theo makes his way to the grove. It's the month of January. He made a New Year's vow to quit smoking, but he smokes a cigarette before entering the grove. Psychotherapists tend to view smoking as an unresolved addiction, one that any decent therapist should have worked through and overcome, he says, which irritates him. He doesn't want people to smell his smokes, so he takes a mint to mask the stench. Theo meets Yuri, the mental nurse's supervisor. Yuri has a cheerful and laid-back demeanor. He introduces Theo to Stephanie Clark, the Grove's manager, who has a severe and guarded demeanor. She offers Theo a personal assault alert that he must keep on him at all times. The patients are having a community meeting, according to Yuri, so it's quiet right now. Theo inquires whether he may attend the conference. Analysis of Part 1 Chapters 1-4 to The concept of betrayal is highlighted with an introduction remark from Sigmund Freud, which returns several times throughout Part 1. For example, Theo Faber and his wife Catherine, Kathy, began their relationship with an affair. The Sigmund Freud phrase refers to the concept that the truth always comes out in the end, an adage that will be proven true in the silent patient's story. Part 1 opens with a remark from Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, which is both conceptually and thematically appropriate given the novel's focus on mental health. The first four chapters set the tone, offering factual information concerning Gabriel's murder and Alicia's trial. These terrible details, and the murder itself, appear to be at odds with the glimpse into Alicia's inner workings that the reader gets owing to the prologue's passage from her journal. The novel's use of the epistolary approach, which includes external media such as journal entries, is crucial in providing insight into Alicia's character, who remains silent for the time being. Her journal writings, in which she confesses her love for the spouse she would soon murder, add to the intrigue surrounding the assassination. In their journal, Alicia alluded to mental health difficulties, which is a recurring subject throughout the narrative. I'm only going to write positive, happy, normal thoughts, she maintains in her journal, implying that her character is self-conscious and aware of a fight with sanity. No outlandish ideas are permitted. Because the reader already knows that Alicia would murder her husband shortly after, this comment throws doubt on her sanity and appears to reinforce the court's finding that she killed Gabriel in a condition of diminished responsibility. The self-portrait that Alicia draws after Gabriel's death is a significant symbol that will take on greater significance as the mystery unfolds. The link to Alcestis, the Greek tragedy mentioned in the novel's epigraph, is introduced through the painting. But why doesn't she speak, begins one of the novel's and Theo's key questions. The second question is why Alicia murdered her husband in the first place. These are the two major puzzles to be solved. Theo's concern with these inquiries draws attention to his character's own mental health issues. I was fucked up, Theo declares in his introduction. Theo puts his messed up status behind him, focusing on his terrible background in an abusive household, his attempted suicide, and his subsequent rehabilitation with Ruth. He appears to be attempting to imply that he has moved on from his own mental health issues, but they look to be unresolved to the objective reader. The fact that Theo smokes in secret irritates him because psychotherapists tend to view smoking as an unresolved addiction, one that any decent therapist should have worked through and overcome, he writes. The motif of smoking will reappear, this time as a reflection of mental health difficulties. I am not the hero of this story, Theo says. Because this is Alicia Berenson's narrative, I'll start with her and the Alcestis. As a result, his character frames the tale as though it were mostly about Alicia. Given how much information about Theo has come to light, his terrible childhood, his own battles with mental health, and his professional path as a forensic psychotherapist, evident it's that Theo has his own tale to tell. Theo's tale will be revealed by recounting Alicia's story, and the two narratives of two unique individuals will eventually cross in a surprise plot twist. Part 1 Chapter 5 
Theo and Alicia meet for the first time in Chapter 5. The actual encounter is a letdown after the building of expectation in the first four chapters, which reveals not only Alicia's rich past, but also a glimpse into her engaging voice through her journal. Theo attends a patient, community meeting. There are also several employees present, including Lazarus and Dira, who was on the interview panel when Theo applied for the position, and Christian, a psychiatrist with whom Theo previously worked. Despite the fact that they didn't work together for long, Theo didn't like Christian much, though he doesn't explain why. Theo can't locate Alicia at first and then spots her, right across from him. She slumped over in her chair, heavily medicated. I hadn't seen her because she was invisible. When another patient, Elif, walks in with a broken pool cue, a potentially lethal weapon, the discussion comes to a halt. While Lazarus and Indira look on, Theo tries to calm Elif down. As Theo engages with the patients, he is surprised to see that Alicia has awakened enough to gaze at him. He's more determined than ever to take Alicia under his care. Part 1 Chapter 6 Theo visits Lazarus after the community meeting. He is taken aback when he discovers the professor's office is crammed with musical instruments. Lazarus states that he leads a casual music club for patients and staff because he believes music may be a useful therapeutic tool. Music hath charms to soothe the savage breast, he says, quoting William Congreve. The grove is in peril, as Lazarus explains to Theo. The number of patients is insufficient, and the operational expenditures are excessive. He tells Theo that Stephanie, the grove's new manager, is there as a last resort. If the grove does not improve its operational efficiency under Stephanie's leadership, it may be forced to close. Theo shifts the focus to Alicia, inquiring if she has ever had individual counseling. Lazarus claims he attempted it, but failed. Theo speculates that Alicia could connect better with a younger psychotherapist like himself. If Alicia had a strained connection with her father, it could be tough for her to open up to Lazarus, 30 years her senior. Lazarus advises Theo that he will most likely fail. He eventually gives in, and explains that the first step is for Yuri to set up a meeting between Theo and Alicia. Part 1 Chapter 7 Theo and Alicia meet for the first time. I tried to silence the negative voices in my head, my father's voice telling me I wasn't up to the job, I was useless, a fraud, he says as he waits for her to arrive. Alicia shows up. Yuri intends to stay in the room since Alicia is a patient who requires constant one-on-one -on -one interaction with a nurse, but Theo urges him to go, telling him that he has his attack alarm with him. There doesn't appear to be any cause for fear, since Alicia remains as unconcerned as she was when Theo first met her at the community meeting. A medicated mask, he says of her face. I was curious as to what lay beneath. Theo remains silent after introducing himself, and the two sit in silence together. Part 1 Chapter 8 Theo checks over Alicia's paperwork after his one-on-one -on -one appointment with her. He only mentions one noteworthy instance. Alicia assaulted Elif in the canteen a few weeks after her admittance, destroying a dish and attempting to slit Elif's throat with the shards. Theo chooses to inquire about the event with Elif. Theo also decides he has to learn more about Alicia's childhood. Her file names an aunt, Lydia Rose, as her next of kin, who raised her after her mother, Eva, died in a car accident. Alicia was also involved in the crash, although she was unharmed. Max Berenson, Alicia's lawyer, is the only other person identified in her file. When Theo phones Max Berenson, he discovers that he will be gone for the rest of the week. He then dials Lydia's number. Lydia says fuck off and hangs up when he explains why he's calling. This painting was Alicia's sole communication, her only testimony, Theo said of the self-portrait Alicia made after the murder. And it was saying something I didn't understand. Part 1 Chapter 9 Yuri approaches Theo, as he is about to leave the grove for the day. 
At the nurse's station, Yuri discovered Theo's pack of smokes, which had apparently slipped out of Theo's pocket. Given that Theo had tried to hide the fact that he had smoked a cigarette before visiting the grove that morning, this is mildly awkward. They proceed to a pub, where Yuri offers to buy Theo a drink. Yuri inquires about Theo's marital status, and Theo confirms that he is married to Catherine, Kathy. Yuri admits that he was once married as well. He's now divorced. He fell in love with the lady on the street, whom he stalked. He tells Theo about how he would stand outside her house and watch for her at the window. When Yuri eventually worked up the nerve to approach the woman, she turned him down. He realized he no longer loved his wife after the incident, so he divorced her. Yuri ends their conversation by telling Theo that he should go home to his wife and leave Alicia alone. Part 1 Chapter 10 Theo goes to the National Theatre Café to meet Kathy. She is an actress who was born and raised in Manhattan, New York. She has dual citizenship because her mother is English. Theo finds her narrating the tale of how she and Theo met a group of ladies from the play she's presently working on. Despite the fact that this is a story of double adultery, Kathy recounts it with a sense of humor that makes the narrative both hilarious and lovely, inspiring laughter. Kathy had a boyfriend named Daniel. Marianne was Theo's girlfriend. Due to some shaky social ties, the four of them met at a pub one night. Kathy and Daniel had a fight, and Daniel had to leave. Theo ignored Marianne's request to return home, so she departed without him. He and Kathy eventually became friends and slept together. The next day, Theo ended his relationship with Marianne. Kathy moved in with him in December of that year after a whirlwind courtship. Theo proposed Christmas. Following their engagement, Theo took Kathy to Surrey to meet his parents. I wanted them to see how happy I was, that I had finally gotten away, that I was finally free. Theo's father was irritable and critical, and his mother was unhappy, so the visit was a disaster. Kathy, on the other hand, took everything in stride, and having seen how horrible Theo's upbringing must have been, earned a newfound respect for him. In April, the couple married in a modest registrar's office with no family present. Analysis of Part 1 Chapters 5 to 10 Chapters 5 to 10 establish the tone for the action ahead by introducing the reader to the two female protagonists who will propel the plot forward, Alicia and Kathy. Theo's professional and personal ties with these two ladies serve as the foundation for the two separate tales that follow and eventually converge. Due to Alicia's drugged state, Theo's first interactions with her are lackluster. Her spit is clogging her lips, her hair is dirty, and the scars from her self-harm attempts are apparent on her wrists. Theo had not anticipated meeting such a downtrodden woman. I simply would not have believed you if you told me this broken shell had once been the brilliant Alicia Berenson, described by those who knew her as dazzling, fascinating, and full of life, Theo adds. Kathy. Theo's second female companion is the polar opposite of Alicia. Kathy is a brazen raconteur who has no qualms about relaying the story of how she and Theo met, a night of double adultery on both of their parts. It's hard to imagine two more different women than Kathy and Alicia, Theo observes. Kathy conjures up images of sunshine, warmth, color, and laughter in me. When I think about Alicia, I only think of darkness, melancholy, and depth. In the silence. The contrast between Kathy and Alicia's personas serve to emphasize the mental illness topic. Alicia has mental health concerns, as evidenced by her own journal entry in the prologue, in which she explains her creative despair and attempts to avoid crazy thoughts. Kathy appears to be unaffected by such issues. Kathy did that a lot, protesting her insanity, I'm crazy, I'm nuts, I'm insane, she'd say, but I never believed her," Theo adds. She smiled far too readily and frequently for me to think she had gone through what I had. Kathy saved Theo and gave him his first taste of true closeness. Theo, on the other hand, is the one who has to save Alicia. Alicia was lost, he decides, after seeing her for the first time at a community gathering. She had vanished. 
and I meant to track her down. You think you can help her, Theo? Lazarus asks, recognizing the urge. Are you capable of rescuing Alicia? Make her say something? The title of the novel, The Silent Patient, alludes to the prevailing perception that Alicia is a problem that needs to be fixed. Alicia's identity is fixed as someone in need of care, a passive patient awaiting therapy, rather than the silent girl or the silent woman. The fact that Lazarus refers to Alicia as a siren foreshadows the notion that, as docile as she appears to be, Alicia still possesses the capacity to destroy. The usage of an illusion in this discussion between Lazarus and Theo in Chapter 6 also provides foreshadowing. Music has charms to soothe the savage breast, Lazarus says of his music therapy group, quoting English dramatist William Congreve. This remark comes from the sad drama The Morning Bride by Congreve, which depicts the narrative of a queen, Zara, who is kept hostage by King Manuel of Granada. The tragedy is about love and duplicity, and it ends with Manuel, who is in disguise, being killed by mistake and Zara committing suicide. Part 2 Chapter 1 Part 2 begins with a quote from Sigmund Freud, Unexpressed emotions will never die. They've been buried alive, and will resurface in uglier forms later. The first chapter of Part 2 is made up of passages from Alicia Berenson's journal, which span the dates of July 16th to July 21st. Alicia writes about the heat wave in London at the time, recalling the summer her mother died, and her childhood memories of playing outside with her cousin Paul Rose. When she thinks about her mother, she remembers her smells like Nivea hand lotion and shampoo, as well as cigarettes and a hint of vodka, hinting that Eva had a drinking problem. Eva strapped Alicia into the passenger seat of her yellow automobile on the day of her death. Alicia now associated the color yellow with death, and then drove right into a brick wall. With her latest painting, A Composition of Jesus on the Cross, Alicia muses on the creative block she is experiencing. She's been stuck painting the face for a long time and has now realized why. It's the face of her husband Gabriel, not Jesus. She concludes that all she needs is Gabriel to pose for her. Gabriel is hesitant, pointing out that Alicia's portrayal of her husband as Jesus would seem unusual to others. However, he accepts, and they spend the afternoon together posing for her. When she gets to the eyes, Alicia becomes angry because they remain dead, lifeless. Part 2 Chapter 2 The story shifts back to Theo. He contacts Lazarus about lowering Alicia's pharmaceutical dosage in the hopes of jolting her awake. Christian is the leader of Alicia's care staff, according to Lazarus, and Theo should deal with him personally. Lazarus also mentions that he senses some animosity between Theo and Christian. Lazarus agrees to discuss decreasing Alicia's dose with Christian. Part 2 Chapter 3 Theo runs across Indira while searching the halls of the grove for a hidden smoking location. She suspects he's lost and leads him to the nurse's station, also known as the Goldfish Bowl. Christian and Theo speak for the first time since Theo's arrival. Elif's past is revealed during Christian and Theo's talk. She suffocated her mother and sister while they were sleeping. Christian also informs Theo that the grove is about to close and asks why Theo would accept a position at a failed business. A sinking ship is deserted by rats. Christian states they don't clamber aboard. Theo is taken aback by Christian's abrasive tone, but it quickly becomes evident why. Christian discovered that Theo had gone behind his back to discuss Alicia's medicine with Lazarus. Christian thinks Theo is squandering his time with Alicia. Overhearing their chat, and Dira expresses her increased trust in Theo, adding, I feel she needs someone to look after her. And now she has you. She also points out that therapy isn't simply about talking, suggesting that nonverbal communication accounts for the majority of the conversation. Part 2 Chapter 4 Theo meets with Alicia a few days later. Her medicine has been modified, and she is now more aware. Theo requests that Yuri remains outside the room once more, despite the fact that this is strictly against the procedure. 
Theo sits with Alicia quietly at first, after welcoming her and inquiring about how she's doing. He informs her at the conclusion of the session that he wants to assist her in seeing properly. Alicia reacts by lunging at him, knocking him to the ground and choking him. The assault alarm is pressed by Theo. Christian sedates Alicia after four nurses whisk her away from Theo. She didn't seem human, Theo observes, more like a wild animal, something monstrous. Part 2 Chapter 5 Stephanie, Lazarus, Indira and Christian are among the people Theo encounters. He makes a compelling argument for continuing his collaboration with Alicia by presenting the occurrence in a favorable light. Rage is a potent communication. Her assault reveals something about her grief that she is unable to express clearly. This argument does not persuade Stephanie and Christian, but Lazarus and Indira support Theo. In a way, Alicia has started to talk, Indira observes. She's interacting with her advocate, Theo. Stephanie is adamant about putting an end to any attempts to cooperate with Alicia. Lazarus, on the other hand, makes the final choice and gives Theo six weeks. Alicia won't talk in six weeks or sixty years, Christian predicts, implying that Theo will fail. Analysis of Part 2 Chapters 1-5 to The importance of nonverbal communication is underlined by both Indira and Theo, in reference to Alicia in the introductory quotation from Sigmund Freud. Nonverbal communication is also evident in Alicia's paintings, which are discussed in greater depth in Part 2. Experts in the field of diaries share further information about Alicia's history. As she shares open, troubling recollections of her mother Eva's apparent death, her voice grows stronger. Even more concerning is the fact that her mother had Alicia in the car with her when she crashed into a wall, implying that she would have had no qualms, or even intended to, killing her own kid. As Alicia writes detailed flashback-like memories of major historical events, particularly the day her mother dies, the tone is introspective and somber. She creates a sensory experience that is rich in detail, such as the heat of the day and the contrast between the yellow mini vehicle and the red brick wall. The introspective, thoughtful writing in Alicia's journal contrasts sharply with the lady depicted by Theo in the present-day narrative, an over-medicated ghost of a person who, when she eventually wakes up, just wants to launch a brutal attack, less human and more like a wild animal, something monstrous, according to Theo. Alicia's diary also goes into further detail about her connection with Gabriel, adding to the mystery of why Alicia killed her husband. The fact that Alicia paints Jesus with her husband's face reveals a power dynamic, which is first indicated in the prologue, in which Gabriel is the leader and she is the follower, his disciple. I don't believe you're the son of God, she says to Gabriel. It was just something that naturally occurred while I was painting. I haven't given it much thought. Gabriel suggests that she thinks about it, alluding to the idea that people's subconscious behaviors might reveal crucial information about them. Not just in the Jesus picture, but also in Gabriel's name, there is a religious connotation. One of the archangels, Gabriel, is a celestial messenger who announced the birth of Jesus to Mary. The name Lazarus contains another religious connotation. Lazarus is a person in the New Testament who is resurrected from the grave by Jesus. When the wealthy man and Lazarus died, Lazarus was brought to Abraham's side, a place of comfort and rest, whereas the rich man went to Hades according to Luke's story, a place of torment. It's therefore natural that Lazarus appears to play a near-divine role at the grove and even inside the novel's plot. Lazarus is the one who offers Theo only six weeks to convince Alicia to communicate in Chapter 5. His actions work as a top-down setup for the story, as if he were a god building a universe and characters and then watching it unfold. He propels the story forward with the deadline, creating a sense of urgency. The use of a deadline or timetable in a thriller is a common narrative device used to heighten tension and provide a feeling of danger or urgency to the work. Part 2 Chapter 6 Theo arrives at his residence. Kathy is away, 
practicing for an Othello performance. Theo takes a jar of marijuana out of its hiding location, assuming she will be gone for at least a few hours. He admits that he smoked in university but quit when he met Kathy. I was naturally high on love with no need to artificially induce a good mood. He also mentions Kathy's opinion about stoners. After taking a whiff of a joint at a party, he surreptitiously and irregularly continued the habit. While high, Theo accesses Kathy's laptop and discovers sexual emails between her and an unknown person. Theo pukes after realizing Kathy is having an affair. Part 2 Chapter 7 Alicia and Theo are having another therapy session. She is still silent, a silent siren luring me to my doom, she says. Theo begins to speak about himself. He inquires about Alicia's feelings for her spouse. While he loves his wife, he acknowledges that love encompasses all kinds of feelings, good and bad. Theo believes that a portion of Alicia had to despise her spouse. Alicia runs out, visibly upset. But that's what Alicia did for you, Theo says, describing his actions as clumsy and revealing more about his state of mind than Alicia's. Her quiet reflected back at you like a mirror. And it was frequently an unsightly sight. Part 2 Chapter 8 The news of Kathy's adultery has left Theo shaken, but he has yet to approach her about it. He returns home from work at the Grove to find Kathy gone, and takes advantage of the chance to get high and drink wine. The chorus of voices in my head grew louder and wouldn't be silenced, he says. She was destined to be unfaithful, it was unavoidable, I was never good enough for her. He goes to see Ruth, his former therapist, after realizing he needs help. Part 2 Chapter 9 the romance is revealed to Ruth by Theo. Kathy had become bored with the relationship according to Theo, and is the kind of person who would love a hidden affair. She enjoyed lying and sneaking around, it was like acting but off stage. Ruth comes to the conclusion that Kathy's treachery is so severe that Theo must abandon her. She informs him, I don't think you could go back even if you wanted to. Theo leaves Ruth's house with the intention of returning home, confronting Kathy and then abandoning her. Part 2 Chapter 10 Theo can't bring himself to approach Kathy when he arrives home from Ruth's. Kathy, in an unexpected turn, confronts him about the marijuana she has discovered. Theo admits to having been smoking. Sometimes I think I don't know you at all, Kathy remarks exasperatedly, which is precisely what Theo was thinking about her. Theo is angry at her answer and wants to confront her with what he knows, but he can't bear it and instead cries himself to sleep. He resolves to act as if nothing occurred the next day, leaving Kathy would be like ripping off a limb. I wasn't ready to mutilate myself in that way. Against Ruth's advice, Ruth wasn't infallible, he thinks to himself, he resolves to act as if he never received those emails and remain strong for his patients and himself. Analysis of Part 2 Chapters 6-10 to These chapters are dominated by Theo's revelation of Kathy's adultery and his reaction to it. Kathy is no longer the 55-year-old Greek goddess come to life, she was on their first date. Theo adored Kathy, much as Alicia adored Gabriel, but this fantasy was shattered. Kathy hadn't rescued me, and she couldn't save anyone. She wasn't a heroine to be praised. She was just a scared, messed-up girl who cheated on her boyfriend. This entire narrative about us that I had constructed dot now crumbled in a matter of seconds, like a house of cards in a strong wind. The comparison shows the vulnerability of love based on idolization, on perceiving someone as their ideal self rather than their genuine flawed self. The connection to Othello is one of the novel's numerous theatric allusions. Othello strangles his wife Desdemona to death in Othello, believing she is an adulteress. Othello kills himself after understanding Desdemona's innocence. He stabs another man, Iago, to death, blaming him for the mistake. As a result, this metaphor foreshadows the impending bloodshed. Such dramatic allusions, many of which are two tragic plays, 
connect to the novel's core theme, the human urge to show a particular face to the world, frequently a false one. Theo himself is concerned with maintaining appearances, as seen by his desire to conceal the fact that he smokes cigarettes from his colleagues, owing to the widespread perception among psychiatrists that smoking is associated with unresolved mental health difficulties. Even when it comes to Kathy, his personal girlfriend, Theo feels compelled to put on a show, concealing his marijuana usage because he knows she would disapprove. Even after discovering Kathy's adultery, despite Ruth's advice to leave, he can't let her go and clings to some semblance of their former love. She was the love of my life, she was my life and I wasn't ready to give her up. No, not yet. I still loved her despite the fact that she had deceived me. After all, I might have been insane. In the wake of Kathy's treachery, Theo's mental health deteriorates. When his negative self-talk spirals, as it did before his suicide attempt in university, he smokes more and calls his former therapist, Ruth. It cradled me and held me safe like a well-loved child, Theo says of marijuana. To put it another way, it contained me. He expands on psychotherapist W. R. Bion's concept of containment, which relates to a mother's capacity to comfort a newborn. If a baby does not experience containment via the mother, he or she will grow up to be an anxious adult who is unable to control himself or herself. As a child, Theo hints that he lacked confinement. Theo's problems with his mother are emblematic of the way he sees older women, particularly Ruth and Indira, as maternal, pointing out their maternal characteristics. Part 2 Chapter 11 Theo returns to the grove in search of Elif. He's curious about her last confrontation with Alicia and what she said to rile her up. If he deserved it. Him, Elif informs him, she questioned Alicia. Her bloke, Gabriel, her spouse. Theo feels appalled, but he doesn't say anything. He walks away. Outside, he receives a call from Max, whom he had earlier contacted in the hopes of learning more about Alicia. Max grudgingly agrees to talk with Theo and recommends they meet the next evening at his office. Part 2 Chapter 12 Theo is in Max Berenson's office the next day. Theo shifts the focus of the conversation to Alicia. The night before the murder, Max had dinner with Alicia and Gabriel. Max claims that they both seemed normal, but Alicia was a little more jumpy than usual. Max admits that he despised Alicia. He claims she had mood swings, rages, violent fits, and threatened to murder Gabriel even before the murder. Max also admits that after her father died, Alicia tried suicide. She ingested an excessive amount of pills or something. As Theo walks out of Max's office, Tanya, Max's assistant and wife whispers to him that if he wants to know anything about Alicia, he should speak with her cousin Paul in Cambridge. Ask him about Alicia and the night after the accident and... When Max walks into the room, Tanya comes to a halt. Theo notices Tanya's fear of Max and wonders why she is. Max's remark that if Theo wants gossip, he could go to Jean Felix Martin, the gallery owner who showcased Alicia's work, adds to the mystery. Part 2 Chapter 13 Chapter 13 contains passages from Alicia's journal, from July 22 to July 26. These are more chaotic than prior portions. Alicia and Gabriel had a fight regarding Gabriel keeping a pistol in the house, despite her repeated requests for him to get rid of it. She says in her letter, I raised my voice, but he raised his even louder, and we were shouting at one another before I realized it. Gabriel has an aggressive side to him, which I only see on rare occasions and which concerns me. It's as if you're living with a stranger for those few seconds. Max invites Alicia and Gabriel around for supper, on another occasion. He and Alicia have private time in the kitchen, and she informs him that she intends to inform Gabriel about a previous incident in which Max kissed and touched her while inebriated. At this point he presses himself on her again, she bites his tongue and he labels her a fucking bitch. Alicia sits with Max and Gabriel during dinner, acting as if nothing has occurred. I feel better for having written this down, 
the diary's tone says. Having it written down makes me feel safer. It implies that I have some proof. Alicia is delighted in the final journal entry, commemorating her birthday. Gabriel had a picnic ready for her. Then he asked if she wanted to have a child with him. He had earlier said that he did not wish to have children. In her journal, Alicia also confessed that she is afraid of having children, saying, I am not to be trusted with them. Not with the blood of my mother coursing through my veins. She, on the other hand, is pleased and accepts when Gabriel asks. Part 2 Chapter 14 Theo dials Max's number for a follow-up call. Max is irritated. When Theo inquires about the hospital where Alicia was treated following her suicide attempt, Max confesses that Gabriel had a private doctor come over and treat her in order to keep the event quiet. Theo inquires as to whether or not Alicia was the primary beneficiary of Gabriel's bequest. Max confesses that he is the primary benefactor of the scheme. Lazarus summons Theo to his office the next day and chastises him for bothering Max. Max called to express his displeasure with Theo's harassment. You're going about this the wrong way, Lazarus says Theo. You're asking questions and looking for clues like it's a detective novel, she says, telling him to just go to treatment and not see any of Alicia's family. Theo concurs. Part 2 Chapter 15 Following the confidential tip Tanya gave him, Theo promptly breaches his vow to Lazarus and travels to Cambridge in search of Paul, Alicia's cousin. Lydia Rose, Paul's mother, and Alicia's aunt was the one who looked after Alicia when Eva died. Find out what happened to shape Alicia, make her into the person she became, a person capable of murder, he says. This is the psychological puzzle that has turned Theo into something of a detective. He can't ask Alicia about her childhood for clues, so he needs to go elsewhere. Theo glimpses an elderly woman's face, Aunt Lydia's, at the window while walking around the grounds of Alicia's childhood house. Then he hears footsteps behind him and is struck on the back of the head by someone. Following that, Theo goes into a coma. Part 2 Chapter 16 when Theo awakens, he discovers Paul Rose standing over him, smelling like alcohol. Paul has already verified Theo's identification and established that he works at the Grove. Paul agrees to address Theo's Alicia-related queries. Lydia and Paul moved into the house when Lydia's husband, Paul's father, died when Paul was about eight or nine years old. It was supposed to be a one-time thing, but Eva died, so they stayed. Vernon, Alicia's father, died only a few years ago. He committed suicide in the attic, and Paul discovered his body. Paul recalls seeing Alicia during her father's funeral. I never believed it, you know, Paul replies. It didn't make sense to me that she killed Gabriel. She wasn't a violent individual. Lydia interrupts Paul and Theo's conversation by demanding to speak with Theo. Part 2 Chapter 17 Theo speaks with Lydia, who is abrasive and looks to be suffering from a mental illness, maybe dementia. Theo adds, there was madness in her gaze, I felt quite certain of that. Lydia expresses her distaste for Alicia by remarking, she's a little bitch. She's always been that, even as a youngster. She claims that she looked after Alicia and that she was ungrateful. Alicia even made an obscene mockery of Lydia by painting an unpleasant image of her. Lydia comes to the conclusion that Alicia belongs in prison, not a mental facility. Theo leaves the house sorrowful, thinking to himself that if he hadn't left his parents' home, he would have inevitably become an alcoholic under his parents' strict control. He understands why Alicia fled home as soon as she could after meeting despotic Aunt Lydia as growing up with Aunt Lydia was undoubtedly terrible. Part 2 Chapter 18 When Theo gets home, he tries to check Kathy's emails, but she is locked out. I had enough self-awareness to appreciate the cliché I had become, the jealous husband, and the irony that Kathy was currently rehearsing Desdemona in Othello hadn't escaped me, 
he says of the absurdity of her preparing Desdemona in Othello. He comes up with bizarre explanations to explain the emails and show Kathy's innocence, such as that she was writing in character while rehearsing for the play, but he points out that she signed the letters Kathy rather than Desdemona. On the surface, their relationship hasn't altered, according to Theo. Internally he's whirling, trying to figure out why she cheated, and outwardly he's monitoring her email and phone whenever he can. He's skeptical when Kathy says she'll be seeing a friend, Nicole, on Thursday night after rehearsal and would be home late. If this is true, he concludes that there is only one way to find out, he intends to pursue her. Part 2 Chapter 19 Theo pays a visit to Alicia's gallery in order to meet Jean Felix. Jean Felix has a grudge against Max and appears to have had a tumultuous relationship with Gabriel. Gabriel may have seen Jean Felix as a danger or been jealous of his strong connection with Alicia, according to the evidence. Alicia and Jean Felix met in art school and had been friends for a long time. She didn't look like she was going to shoot her husband in a few days, Jean Felix says when Theo asks how Alicia appeared when he last saw her, days before the murder. Part 2 Chapter 20 Four of Alicia's paintings are shown to Theo by Jean Felix. The first is of Alicia's mother, Eva, who was killed in a vehicle accident. The second is a picture of Jesus on the crucifixion, with Gabriel as Jesus. Lydia is shown in the third photo, enormously fat and naked on a sagging bed. Alcestis, the fourth painting, is a self-portrait. This time though, Theo sees a new detail. In the picture there is a dish of apples and the fruits are covered with maggots. Theo is encouraged by Jean Felix to read Euripides' play. Theo inquires about Alicia's father and her subsequent suicide attempt with Jean Felix. Theo deduced from the sequence of events that Alicia adored Vernon and was devastated by his death. Alicia despised Vernon, according to Jean Felix. Jean Felix proposes remorse as a reason when asked why Alicia might try to kill herself following Vernon's death. Theo, on the other hand, has the impression that Jean Felix is hiding information. Part 2 Chapter 21 Following Jean's recommendation, Felix's Theo purchases a copy of Euripides' Alcestis Tragedy. He mentions the deus ex machina conclusion, which refers to an apparently insoluble situation, Alcestis' death, being solved abruptly when Heracles brings her back from the dead. Theo is taken aback by the conclusion, Alcestis' incapacity to talk. But why is my wife standing here and not speaking? Admetus begs Heracles, desperate. Why? Theo and Admetus both question at the end of the chapter. Why isn't she saying anything? Analysis of Part 2 Chapters 11-21 Part 2's first 10 chapters concentrated mostly on Theo, his discovery of Kathy's affair and subsequent mental unraveling, Chapters 11-21, through 21, focus primarily on Alicia, intensifying the mystery surrounding her character and her husband's death. The mystery is heightened by conflicting stories. On the one hand, Max discloses Alicia's violent background, claims to despise her and mentions that she had previously vowed to murder Gabriel, as well as attempted suicide. On the other side, Paul asserts that Alicia was never violent. Then there's Tanya, who quietly pulls Theo aside and tells him to speak with Paul about what happened the night following the accident, Eva's death. Because of the conflicting reports, the mystery grows and gets more complicated. While Max offers a plain picture of a mentally ill lady, the reader is skeptical of his story, knowing that Alicia rejected him. The reader obtains insight into Alicia's world while Theo stays in the dark, demonstrating the significance of the epistolary style. Theo must continue to play detective in order to obtain information that the reader already knows and the details he gathers, such as the knowledge that Gabriel will leave everything to Max, provide the reader with a deeper, more nuanced picture. Through Jean Gallery Felix's tour, both the reader and Theo obtain a better visual understanding of Alicia. Each of the images of Alicia's deceased mother, despotic Aunt Lydia, 
and deified Gabriel as Jesus is a symbolic portrayal of Alicia's connection with the person represented. Eva is a ghost, Lydia is a dictator, and Gabriel is the Almighty. If you really want to get Alicia to talk, give her some paint and brushes, Jean Felix urges Theo, reiterating that Alicia, despite her muteness, can communicate in other ways. Allow her to express herself via painting. That is the only way she will communicate with you. Theo not only takes on the detective role in Alicia's story, but also in his own. When Kathy reveals her planned night out with Nicole, Theo becomes suspicious and decides that there's only one way to find out, meaning that he intends to follow her. In the subplot of Kathy's affair, a second mystery is developing, and Theo will end up playing detective in both this secondary storyline and the main plotline involving Alicia's silence and Gabriel's death. The narrative structure varies in terms of substance and style, as these chapters focus on Theo's search for answers. Previously, much of the action took occurred in the Grove, or at Theo's house with Kathy. He's taking on the role of a detective now, going in search of answers, for example, asking inquiries at Max Berenson's London office and then driving to Cambridge to find Paul. He's even referred to as a detective, by Lazarus and Jean Felix. The chapters grow shorter and sharper as the action becomes more fast-paced and externally driven, less inward. This is typical of many suspense novels, which aim to keep the reader turning the pages with action-packed chapters that finish on a cliffhanger. Part 2 Chapter 22 Alicia's journal entries from August 2nd to 6th make up Chapter 22. In one, she mentions receiving a call from Paul, who insists on meeting with her in person, at which time he confesses he has a significant gambling debt and asks for her assistance in repaying it. She accepts his offer to write him a check. Jean Felix pays Alicia a visit in another entry. He's more attached to my paintings than he is to me, she says, recognizing that their friendship is based on his utilizing her for her work. On this day, she informs him that she intends to move to a new gallery, which both surprises and enrages Jean Felix. He persuades her to accompany him to visit Euripides Alcestis on Friday. She states that she says yes because she is terrified of him. Part 2 Chapter 23 Theo goes to Lazarus and tells him about Alcestis, hoping for some insight into the significance of the play. How would you feel? Lazarus inquires. Through their own cowardice, the person you love most in the world has damned you to death. That's a huge betrayal. Theo recognizes that this will arouse rage in both Alcestis and Alicia. Alicia didn't die physically, but something murdered her spirit, her feeling of being alive, he understands. Theo asks Lazarus if he may give her painting tools, in order to encourage Alicia to talk. Theo will have to clarify this with Alicia's art therapist, Rowena Hart, according to Lazarus. Part 2 Chapter 24 Apart from typical art therapy, Theo contacts Rowena about supplying Alicia with her own painting tools. He anticipates Rowena's reluctance, Lazarus forewarned him, but the woman gladly accepts. Rowena is relieved to be free of Alicia, whom she describes as the least responsive, most uncommunicative bitch I've ever worked with. Part 2 Chapter 25 Theo tells Alicia that he went to the gallery to meet Jean Felix and saw some of her works, including Alcestis. He also gives her his copy of the play, drawing a clear analogy between Alicia and Alcestis. Why doesn't she speak, he asks. Admetus poses the question. Alicia, I'm asking you the same question. What is it that you are unable to express? He informs her that he has set up a separate painting nook for her, and asks whether she would like it. With a smile, she answers. Part 2 Chapter 26 In the canteen, Theo runs into Christian. Christian had previously heard about Theo's idea to have Alicia paint and cautions him. He informs Theo, borderlines are seductive. He tells Theo that Alicia is going to betray him. Despite these warnings, 
Theo phones the gallery's Jean Felix and asks whether he may pick up Alicia's old painting equipment. Part 2 Chapter 27 Theo sees Kathy off as she leaves for rehearsal at home. She intends to meet up with her buddy Nicole afterward. She informed Theo about the meeting the week before, and Theo is certain it was a ruse to see her boyfriend. He waits outside the theater where Kathy is rehearsing and then follows her. He thinks she's about to meet up with her lover, but Nicole turns up instead. Kathy wasn't telling the truth. Theo is both astonished and dissatisfied. Part 2 Chapter 28 Yuri and Theo show Alicia around her own painting studio. She appears pleased and at ease, and she jumps right into painting. Her painting takes shape over the next few days. It depicts the grove, a red brick structure, on fire and burning to the ground. Two people are attempting to flee the flames. Alicia is one of them. Theo is the other. He has Alicia in his arms and is lifting her aloft. I couldn't tell if I was depicted rescuing Alicia or about to throw her into the flames, he says. Part 2 Chapter 29 Barbie Hellman, who lived next door to Alicia and Gabriel at the time of the murder, pays Alicia a visit at the Grove. She claims to be Alicia's close friend. While she does come in on a regular basis, it's evident that she solely comes to chat about herself. Theo approaches Barbie and expresses his want to speak with her about Alicia. Alicia confided in me all the time, Barbie adds. Theo agrees to see her that evening at her house. Part 2 Chapter 30 Barbie meets Theo. In the weeks leading up to Gabriel's murder, Alicia divulged one crucial piece of information to her, she had a stalker. She even snapped a picture of him. Barbie has a duplicate however, it just depicts a fuzzy shape beside a tree. Barbie urged Alicia to inform Gabriel and the authorities. Later, Alicia informed Barbie that she had discussed it with Gabriel and believed she was hallucinating. Part 2 Chapter 31 When Theo arrives at the grove, he finds it in a state of disarray. Alicia used one of her paintbrushes to stab Elif in the eye. Her expression reminded me sharply of the painting, The Alcestis, Theo remarks after seeing Alicia shortly after, standing completely motionless and tranquil. Blank and emotionless. Empty. She locked her gaze on me. And for the first time in my life, I was terrified. Part 2 Chapter 32 Theo and Yuri break into Alicia's art studio to investigate why she assaulted Elif. They discover that someone has vandalized Alicia's painting by writing slut in red paint over it. Theo rushes to the emergency room to talk with Elif. Elif joyously discloses that she told Alicia the truth, that Theo is in love with her, when he asks what prompted Alicia's attack. Elif comes to the conclusion that Alicia is a fucking nut and a psycho, and Theo can't help but question if she's correct. Part 2 Chapter 33 Lazarus invites Theo, Stephanie, Indira and Christian to a meeting at his office. Alicia has been placed in isolation, and her treatment will soon come to an end. Theo makes an attempt to persuade, but the choice is final. Alicia isn't a suitable candidate for psychotherapy, Lazarus concludes. I should never have let it happen. Part 2 Chapter 34 Alicia and Theo have one last rendezvous. He expresses regret that she is currently in solitude. He also admits that he understands her fear. Finally, he expresses his disappointment. I'm disappointed that our work is coming to an end before we've even properly begun, and I'm disappointed that you didn't try harder. Alicia responds by handing him her journal, which she plainly intends for him to read. Analysis of Part 2 Chapters 22-34 Alicia's journal entries gradually function as red herrings, or hints that divert the reader's attention away from Theo, the novel's true villain. Everyone becomes a suspect, 
as the complexity of Alicia's different relationships is revealed. Max, who was envious of Gabriel and pretended to love Alicia, is one of them. There's Jean Felix, who's furious that Alicia is about to quit his gallery. There's even Alicia's cousin Paul, who is in debt due to gambling and is seeking aid in secret. These details, along with the knowledge of Alicia's stalker, make the reader think that Gabriel's assassination was not as simple as it appears. While the reader may begin to worry about the circumstances behind the murder, Theo is preoccupied with the mystery of Alicia's silence. He attempts to break through the language barrier by providing her with a nonverbal mode of communication, painting. Theo's obsession derives from the fact that he already knows about the circumstances leading up to Gabriel's death because he was present that night. So, while the reader is distracted by the murder mystery, Theo continues to ponder the key issue on his mind. What in Alicia's background functioned as the trigger that enabled her to commit a murder? Alicia's personal association with the Alcestis symbol is disclosed in her journal, where it is revealed that Jean Felix asked her to see the Euripides performance shortly before Gabriel's death. Theo confronts Alicia with the play, drawing a clear analogy between her and Alcestis. Why does she not speak, says Theo who has already read the text. Admetus poses the question. Alicia, I'm asking you the same question. What is it that you are unable to express? The boundary between patient and doctor between Theo and Alicia begins to blur as the two narratives, narration of Theo's and Alicia's diary, converge. You're over-identifying with her, Christian wisely observes, informing Theo. It is self-evident. You know she's the patient, not you. When Alicia delivers Theo her journal to read in part two, the two narratives and Theo's Alicia's are completely melded together. Theo will now have access to information about Alicia's background that was previously only available to the reader. The border between the two storylines blurs now that Theo has access to Alicia's voice, at least in writing. This blending of storylines is also seen in Alicia's artwork of herself and Theo fleeing from the grove's burning structure. I couldn't tell if I was depicted in the act of rescuing Alicia or about to throw her into the flames, Theo says of the image, which adds to the mystery and foreshadows the reality of Theo's relationship with Alicia. Theo has been framed as Alicia's savior thus far, yet, the reader will discover in the novel's concluding chapters that Theo is the cause of her mental breakdown on the night of Gabriel's murder. Part 3 Part 3 begins with two quotations. I mustn't put strangeness where there isn't any, writes Jean-Paul Sartre. That, I believe, is the risk of keeping a diary. You exaggerate everything, you are constantly on the lookout, and you stretch the facts. Jean-Paul Sartre is a French philosopher. Though I am not naturally honest, I am sometimes so by chance, says William Shakespeare in The Winter's Tale. Part 3 contains the rest of Alicia's journal entries, which span from August 8th to August 25th. Alicia becomes aware of a guy following her. She informs Gabriel, after meeting him several times. He speculates that it may be Jean Felix, but Alicia is certain that this is not the case. Alicia then informs her next-door neighbor, Barbie. Finally, Gabriel, certain that Alicia is insane, brings her to visit Dr. West, a psychologist. Dr. West likewise doesn't believe Alicia, telling her that she too had paranoid illusions after her father died, believing someone was following her. He prescribes an antipsychotic medicine, but she refuses to take it because she wants to be vigilant in the event of a potential threat. I need my wits about me now. I have to be ready. Alicia's terror is evident as she begins to hide her journal and spends three days indoors. Alicia joins Gabriel for dinner with Max and his new girlfriend, Tanya, on August 24, the night before the murder. Max has convinced Alicia that he is the stalker, and she confronts him. She follows him to the bathroom after he leaves the table and accuses him of spying on her. He laughs and calls her a crazy bitch, to which she responds by slapping him. Tanya is furious after seeing the event and exits the restaurant. Alicia no longer believes Max is the stalker after this, 
but she has no idea who it is. The stalker is attempting to enter the house, she writes in her journal on August 25. He's inside the house, says the journal at the conclusion. Part 3 Analysis Alicia's anxiety that someone is spying on her and following her is the center of Part 3. Gabriel doesn't believe her, even if this is true and she does have a stalker. The lines that precede Part 3 provide a contrast that makes the reader confused about how to interpret Alicia's worry in this setting. On the one hand, her journal entries come out as crazy, implying that the Sartre phrase is accurate. Is she merely exaggerating and adding strangeness where there is nothing? Her journal writings, on the other hand, are entirely accurate, as frantic as they may appear. Alicia does, in fact, have a stalker, as the reader will discover. Her delusions make her an untrustworthy narrator, and her hysterical conduct makes her allegations of a stalker even more dubious, but in her heightened level of awareness, nourished by hysteria, she is really being honest, possibly by chance, as the Shakespeare phrase indicates. Part 3 is unique in that it is entirely made up of Alicia's journal entries, giving us a glimpse into her paranoia in the weeks leading up to Gabriel's murder. Theo's voice is completely missing and the narrative completely immerses the reader in Alicia's world, allowing the reader to experience Alicia's anxiety in its entirety. The reader is unsure how to respond to Alicia's assertions. For starters, Alicia is an untrustworthy narrator with a history of delusions. She suffered psychotic episodes when her father died, it was learned. Then neither Gabriel, Alicia's husband, nor Dr. West, Alicia's psychiatrist, believe her. Barbie, her next-door neighbor, seemed to be more receptive to her narrative. The photo that Alicia gives Barbie, however, works to discredit her. Alicia believes the photo is significant proof since it depicts a guy, but it's simply a blur to Barbie and, subsequently, to Theo when Barbie shows it to him. Part 3 concludes on a cliffhanger, with Alicia's journal revealing that her stalker is still at large. The fact that the journal is dated August 25th adds to the intrigue. This is the day of Gabriel's assassination. The practice of ending a chapter on a cliffhanger is common in thrillers. Part 4 Chapter 1 The goal of therapy is not to correct the past, but to enable the patient to confront his own history and to grieve over it, says Alice Miller in Part 4. Theo has just finished reading the final page of Alicia's journal in tandem with the reader, bringing them both up to date. Many questions remain unanswered in the journal, and Theo is eager to find out the answers. Then there's Dr. West, who treated Alicia secretly after her father died, and again in the weeks leading up to Gabriel's death. Theo is perplexed as to why Dr. West did not testify in Alicia's case. He would have been an excellent character witness. The reader is perplexed, but Theo appears to already know the answer. He slips the journal into his pocket and walks over to Dr. Circa West's office at the Grove. Part 4 Chapter 2 Dr. Circa West is Christian's name. Theo confronts him about what he's discovered in Alicia's diary. Christian says that Gabriel is an old-school classmate who was ordered to surreptitiously treat Alicia following Vernon's death and again when Alicia complained of a stalker. Gabriel paid Christian with cash under the table, and Christian never disclosed the money. Christian will lose his employment and his license if Theo reports the event with Alicia's journal as proof. Christian is forced to tell Theo what he knows about Alicia. Part 4 Chapter 3 Highly paranoid, delusional, psychotic even, Christian says of Alicia, when Theo mentions the stalker, Christian dismisses it as pure fantasy and points out that Alicia has a history of hallucinations. She had earlier accused an old man of spying on her, only to discover that the guy was blind. As a result of the incident, she and Gabriel were forced to relocate. She took an overdose, more for show than anything else, Christian said of Alicia's suicide attempt following Vernon's death. Gabriel was communicating her sorrow. Theo ends his chat by indicating he'll visit Alicia for further information. 
Part 4 Chapter 4 Theo had a conversation with Alicia. He confesses that he is aware of Christian's identity as Dr. West. He informs her that the journal has generated some concerns. Some things don't add up, they don't match up with information I've gathered from other sources. Now that you've given me permission to read it, I feel compelled to look into it more. I trust you understand. When Alicia does not respond, he interprets her quiet as a yes. Before departing, he returns the diary to her. Part 4 Chapter 5 The story then returns to Kathy's affair as a subplot. Theo notices that she is becoming more reckless and outspoken about her secret encounters with her boyfriend. She excuses herself and tells him she's going for a stroll. He pursues her to a park, where she meets a man and engages in sexual activity with him in a forested area. Kathy is moaning as she has sex with her partner, and Theo is hiding. Part 4 Chapter 6 In the current day, Theo confronts Jean Felix with facts gleaned from Alicia's diary, she was preparing to quit his gallery. She said you had romantic feelings for her, Theo informs Max when he phones him about the notebook. I was hoping to see if… Before Theo can continue, Max hangs up. Theo then contacts Paul, who agrees to meet him for a drink in a pub in Cambridge. Theo intends to question Paul about what happened the night following Eva's tragedy. Tanya had already advised Theo to inquire with Paul about the situation. Part 4 Chapter 7 When Theo sees Paul, he informs him of the information he has obtained from Alicia's journal. The last time Paul saw Alicia was during Vernon's funeral, Paul had informed Theo. This was a deception, and Theo now knows that Paul and Alicia met a few weeks before Gabriel's murder when Paul approached Alicia for aid with his gambling bills. Theo then tells Paul what Tanya told him, that he should inquire about Eva's accident the night before. It's probably nothing, Paul says, but it might help you understand Alicia. He promises to show Theo and invites him back to Lydia's home. Part 4 Chapter 8 Paul leads Theo up to Lydia's house's roof. He and Alicia used to hide here when they were youngsters. They were sitting there the night following Eva's accident when Vernon had a nervous breakdown. Paul was about seven or eight years old at the time, and Alicia was about 10. Why did she have to die? Vernon wondered. Why didn't Alicia die instead, you might wonder. He killed me, Alicia replied, looking at Paul. Dad just killed me, says the narrator. This is exactly what I've been looking for, Theo says, dumbfounded. I discovered it, at least the missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, here on a Cambridge roof. He feels that this traumatic experience is what drove Alicia to murder Gabriel. Analysis of Part 4 Chapters 1-8 to eight. Following the completion of Alicia's journal, Theo immediately begins piecing together the jigsaw that explains Alicia's murder of Gabriel and subsequent silence. Paul's revelation is the crucial component. While Paul says, it's probably nothing but, it might help you understand Alicia, Theo recognizes that Vernon's remark would have been a big trauma for Alicia as a youngster because of his psychoanalysis expertise. This, according to Theo, is Alicia's psychological death, a formative childhood event that caused her to despise her father and as a result, to be capable of murdering a man, Gabriel. With this discovery, the issue of treachery comes to a head. As sources of safety, a youngster implicitly trusts his or her father and mother. Alicia's parents both deceived her. Her mother abandoned her, and it's possible that she was planning to murder her. Her father emotionally abandoned her and wished she died. So far the story has presented many sorts of betrayal. For example, Alicia's choice to move galleries implies a business and or friendship betrayal. However, the story makes it apparent that treachery is most painful when love is involved as in Eva and Vernon's violation of a parent's unconditional love. As represented in the continuous subplot of Kathy's affair, 
the topic of betrayal in romantic love is also coming to a climax. I thought of my father, I knew what he'd do in this situation, Theo says as his slide continues, I thought of my father, I knew what he'd do in this situation. He'd assassinate the individual. I could hear my father yelling, be a man. Strengthen your resolve. Was that the best course of action? Are you going to kill him? Alicia was unable to let go of her past tragedy, and Theo seemed to be on the verge of doing the same, unable to separate himself from his painful upbringing at the hands of a violent father. Theo takes satisfaction in escaping his past and his parents, but he appears to be on the verge of mimicking his aggressive father's actions. Paul's disclosure regarding Alicia's childhood tragedy also offers fresh significance to the Alcestis symbol and appears to explain why Alicia was drawn to this narrative. According to Theo, Vernon Rose had psychically damned his daughter to death, just as Admetus had physically condemned Alcestis to death. Admetus had to like Alcestis on some level, but Vernon Rose had nothing but hatred for him. Vernon's statements are described by Theo as an act of psychic infanticide and he explains how this episode may be linked to Gabriel's murder from a psychoanalytical standpoint. Imagine hearing your father, the person on whom you rely for survival, wish you were dead. What a scary and devastating experience that must be, for a youngster. You'd lose touch with the source of your trauma over time, separate the causes of it and forget. But like fire from a dragon's belly, all the hurt and hatred would erupt one day. Part 4 Chapter 9 Theo confronts Alicia with what he has learned from Paul, back at the Grove. What your father said is tantamount to psychic murder, he tells her. He assassinated you. With a murderous gaze, Alicia looks straight at Theo at this time. He had certainly struck a chord with the audience. Theo informs her that this is their last chance. He isn't supposed to be meeting with her, and if Lazarus learns of it, he would most certainly fire Theo. Finally, Alicia takes the stage. She's curious as to what Theo expects of her. I want you to keep talking, Theo says, his eyes welling up with tears of joy. Talk to me, says Alicia, who is now talking. Part 4 Chapter 10 Theo meets with Lazarus to inform him about Alicia's conversation. Lazarus allows him to continue working with Alicia. He compliments Theo on his efforts. I felt a small flicker of pride, a son being congratulated by his father, Theo says. Alicia tells Theo her narrative during their next meeting, first the story of her silence, and then the account of Gabriel's dying night. Part 4 Chapter 11 Alicia reveals to Theo why she hasn't spoken in a long time. She attempted to speak immediately after the murder, but no sound came out. She was most likely shocked, according to Theo. By then, it seemed pointless, she said later when she was physically capable of speaking. It was already too late. When asked why she's just now starting to talk, she responds it's due to Theo. She'd like him to know what occurred to her on Gabriel's dying night. Part 4 Chapter 12 The next day, Alicia begins to narrate the narrative of Gabriel's murder night. She continues where she left off in Part 3 of her diary, the intruder, her stalker, is in the home. He wore a dark mask and wielded a knife. She made him an offer of money. He stated that he did not want any money. Alicia tried to flee but he caught her and slashed her throat with the knife. When Alicia recounts these incidents, she becomes distressed. She asks if she may have a smoke when Theo asks if she needs a break. Theo is perplexed as to how she knows he smokes. She tells him she can smell it on him, which embarrasses him because he tries to conceal his habit. The chapter comes to a close, with the two of them agreeing to take a break for a cigarette. Part 4 Chapter 13 In the courtyard, Theo and Alicia converse and walk. Alicia returns to telling the intruder's narrative. When the intruder asked for a drink, she handed him a beer. The man drank and chatted, but Alicia claims she has no recollection of what he said. 
She informs Theo that she was mentally ready to get Gabriel's pistol, which they had hidden in a kitchen cabinet. When she went to fetch it, however, the cabinet was empty. It had already been seized by the invader. Alicia was restrained in a chair by the invader. She was certain the man would murder her. She expresses her gratitude to Theo by saying that she wishes he had. Part 4 Chapter 14 Alicia begins her story inside the therapy room. When Gabriel returned home, he saw Alicia bound to the chair. If she screamed, the invader threatened to shoot Gabriel in the head. When Gabriel stepped in, the intruder surprised him and shot him in the head with his gun. He then used wire to bind the unconscious Gabriel to a chair. The guy lifted the rifle and leveled it at Gabriel as Gabriel regained consciousness. According to Alicia, the man shot Gabriel six times in the head, dropped the pistol on the floor and walked away without saying anything. Analysis of Part 4 Chapters 9-14 to Part 4 opens with yet another phrase, this time referring to one of the key plot twists, Alicia finally speaking. Theo receives the missing piece of the jigsaw of Alicia's childhood trauma from Alicia's cousin Paul. When Theo tells Alicia this, she is forced to confront her long-buried pain, and she finally speaks up. Theo's judgment that the information he got from Paul about Vernon wanting Alicia dead is the final piece of the puzzle is true. Alicia eventually speaks once he tackles this issue with her, admitting her childhood trauma as a mental death. Her ensuing account of Gabriel's murder takes the form of numerous brief chapters with abrupt conclusions. The cliffhangers keep the reader turning the pages while also allowing Theo to insert himself into the story. When Alicia asks for a cigarette, for example, chapter 12 abruptly ends. This interruption is strictly superfluous, but it is priceless since Theo realizes that Alicia has known about his smoking all along. This is a humiliating moment for Theo, since it shows him vulnerability in front of his patient. This dialogue illustrates Alicia's recognition of Theo's own troubles, given Theo's prior statements that smoking is an indication of unresolved psychological concerns. He isn't infallible, she understands. I felt a small flicker of pride, a son congratulated by his father, Theo says of the compliments Lazarus offers him for getting Alicia to communicate. This emphasizes Theo's lack of paternal pride, which he has never had, and his need to find it elsewhere, just as he seeks solace in maternal women like Ruth and Indira to compensate for his mother's failure to protect him from his violent father when he was a youngster. One essential aspect in Alicia's tale sticks out, the accusation that Gabriel was shot six times. Long ago, the authorities acknowledged that he was shot five times, a detail that has come up several times. Alicia changed this information on purpose, but it isn't apparent why, in order to gauge Theo's reaction. There's also a big question mark over Alicia's statement that the intruder should have killed her, and that what he did was worse. These facts imply that there is more to the story than meets the eye. Part 4 Chapter 15 Theo visits Lazarus and informs him about Alicia's narrative. Theo is skeptical of Alicia's account, which presents her as a victim. The fact that the intruder shot Gabriel so many times is a dead indication that she's lying. According to Alicia, the intruder shot Gabriel six times while police say it was only five. I don't believe a single word of it, Lazarus replies, agreeing with Theo that Alicia's narrative is cock and bull. You must refuse to accept her story point-blank, he advises Theo to approach Alicia. Put her to the test. Exercise your right to demand that she tell you the truth. Part 4 Chapter 16 The story then returns to Kathy's affair as a subplot. As she meets her lover, Theo recounts following her. Kathy's lover is then followed home by him. He takes up a rock and prepares to slam it into the man's skull from behind. My hands knew what to do, they had decided to kill him, Theo says at this point, dissociating his consciousness from his body. Theo lifts the boulder but comes to a halt as a nearby house's door opens and people emerge. 
Instead, he pursues the man all the way to his house, where he witnesses him greeting his wife. So I wasn't the only one who had been duped. Something has to be done. But what exactly is it? I wasn't a killer, despite my greatest murderous dreams. I was unable to assassinate him. I'd have to come up with something more brilliant than that. Part 4 Chapter 17 Theo returns to the grove the morning following his talk with Lazarus, ready to confront Alicia. Yuri greets him and informs him that Alicia has overdosed and is in a coma. Andira, Christian and Yuri accompany Theo to see her. One thing that has evaded the notice of everyone else is noticed by Theo. A pinprick has appeared on Alicia's wrist. She was injected with a massive dose of morphine, he realizes. This wasn't a case of overdosing. It was a botched assassination. Part 4 Chapter 18 Lazarus, who had been missing for some time, appears. He and Stephanie are introduced to Theo. They're trying to figure out where Alicia obtained the hydrocodone, which they suspect caused her overdose. Theo informs them that he feels Alicia's condition is the consequence of attempted murder, rather than a suicide attempt. Theo informs Stephanie and Lazarus that Christian had been treating Alicia privately before she arrived at the grove, and that this knowledge explains why Christian was so adamant about getting Alicia to speak. When Lazarus inquires about Alicia's journal, Theo informs him that it is most likely in her room. Lazarus tells Theo to look for it and threatens to call the cops if he doesn't. Part 4 Chapter 19 At the Grove Police Officers Come Theo's account is heard by Chief Inspector Stephen Allen. The inspector says he'll need Theo to make an official statement later. Theo exits and walks up to the goldfish tank, where he observes Yuri selling narcotics to Elif in return for money. He doesn't say anything about the circumstance. Yuri inquires as to what they should do about Jean Felix, who has been anxiously awaiting Alicia's arrival. Theo walks down to reception to see what Jean Felix is doing there, but he's already gone. Part 4 Chapter 20 Theo exits the grove and takes a drag on his cigarette. Max and Tanya are inside a vehicle when it arrives. Max bursts out laughing and begins yelling at Theo. He is aware of Alicia's predicament. Max is enraged and sobbing, and it's evident he cares for Alicia. Max continues to yell, but Theo walks away silently. Part 4 Chapter 21 the story then returns to Kathy's affair as a subplot. Theo remembers standing outside her lover's house and peering through the windows at the man's wife. He then covers his face with a black mask, grabs a knife, and enters the residence. When the wife sees Theo, she freezes in terror. This was the first time I came face to face with Alicia Berenson, Theo says at the end of part four. As they say, the rest is history. Analysis of Part 4 Chapters, 15-21 Part 4 concludes with a surprising storyline surprise that the author has been hinting at throughout the book. The reader finds out that Theo was Alicia's stalker and that Gabriel was the man with whom Kathy had an affair. Kathy's adultery, which was depicted as though it were happening now, in the backdrop of Theo's work at the Grove, really happened six years ago, in the months preceding up to Gabriel's death. Certain things that had previously looked unusual, such as Theo's intense desire to collaborate alongside Alicia, suddenly make sense. Despite this, the author continues to delay the revelation by interspersing red herrings throughout the story. The author dismisses the likelihood that Theo is the one who injected Alicia with the medication. First, there's Lazarus' odd disappearance. He was at the grove that morning and looked rushed, but once medics discovered Alicia, no one could find him. Then there's the fact that Jean Felix paid Alicia a visit at the grove that day for the first time, and then suddenly vanished. Christian's history with Alicia makes him a likely suspect. If Alicia starts talking, she may reveal his unethical secret treatment of her. This last strand is pursued by Theo, 
who proposes it to Lazarus and Stephanie as an explanation. In actuality, Theo is the one who injected Alicia with the medication, which will be revealed in Part 5. As police swarm the grove, Chapter 19 begins with the sentence, From then on things move fast. The hectic speed of Part 4's finale is reflected in this statement. The brief, fast-paced chapters are full of unexpected disclosures, such as Jean Strange Felix's visit to the Grove and Yuri's drug trafficking with Elif. These nuances continue to draw the reader's attention away from Theo, the genuine villain of The Silent Patient. With the closing lines of Chapter 21, the narrative finally reveals Theo as Alicia's stalker, and therefore Gabriel as Kathy's boyfriend, the momentum of the fast-paced chapters, full of little twists and turns with their unexpected disclosures, comes to a crashing halt. Part 5 Chapter 1 The novel's concluding section starts with a biblical verse, If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. 920 In Job Part 5 also begins with Alicia's final journal entry, dated February 23rd penned in her final moments of awareness before succumbing to her coma. She reveals the truth about her stalker, Theo. She recognized him for the first time during the one-on-one -on -one treatment session in which she assaulted him. She later lied about Gabriel's death on purpose to put Theo to the test. He was afraid of me, of what I might say, she said, indicating that he knew she was lying. He was terrified, frightened of the sound of my voice. Theo injected her with morphine because he was afraid. Alicia recounts the facts of Gabriel's murder in her final moments of awareness. Gabriel's affair was revealed to the pair by Theo, who then gave Gabriel a choice, either he or Alicia would die. I don't want to die, Gabriel remarked, therefore sentencing Alicia to death. Theo calls Alicia Gabriel a coward before raising the pistol and threatening to shoot her. She shuts her eyes and hears the gunshot. A shot has been fired into the ceiling by Theo. He then releases Alicia and walks away. Gabriel's treachery has left Alicia mentally damaged, so she takes up the pistol and kills him. Part 5 Chapter 2 Alicia's room is cleaned out by Theo and Indira. Theo is unable to locate Alicia's journal, but is unconcerned since he is unaware of her final entry, which condemns him. I want to be clear, I never thought Alicia would shoot Gabriel, he adds, reflecting on all that has happened. After Alicia lied about the details of Gabriel's murder, making it plain she knew who he was, and framed Christian for the crime, he decided to give her the morphine. Part 5 Chapter 3 Theo runs into Julian McMahon from the Trust, on his way out of the building. Julian informs Theo that the grove is closing and offers him a senior post in a new mental facility. It appears like I've gotten everything I want. Theo says, well almost. He says that he and Kathy relocated to Surrey a year ago, returning to his boyhood home. Theo's father has passed away and his mother is in a nursing home. Kathy isn't the vivacious lady she once was, she's melancholy. Although Theo is still married to her, she is now a ghost. Theo informs Kathy about Alicia's overdose at home. Kathy is deafeningly silent. She and Theo have never spoken about the affair and continue to do so. The doorbell goes off. It's Inspector Allen on the line. He wishes to speak with Theo. Jean Felix went to the Grove to get Alicia's art equipment and paintings for a retrospective of her work that he's arranging. He discovered the journal hidden under a painting in a wooden frame. Inspector Allen reads to Theo the final damning journal entry. Theo feels relieved despite the fact that he knows there is no way out. Analysis of Part 5 Chapters 1-3 Inspector Allen shows up at Theo's house, presumably to arrest him, in the novel's last section revealing the truth about Theo. Despite his sins, Theo believes he saved Alicia by assisting her in identifying her formative childhood trauma, and with it, the cause of her mental breakdown on the night she killed Gabriel. As a result, Theo still feels justified in his work as a psychologist, but he has also condemned himself. 
Theo is brought to justice in Part 5, owing to Alicia's journal. Despite the fact that the silent patient has lost her voice, she has discovered another means to communicate. Her nonverbal communication in the end proved to be equally as valuable as any spoken communication. By the end of the tale, Theo's circumstances confirm his mental condition. He has little regret for what happened to Alicia and believes that by uncovering her early trauma, he benefited her in some way. He also claims that he had no information about Alicia's troubling past. I want to be clear, I never thought Alicia would shoot Gabriel, he says. Ruth seemed to be the only person in Theo's life who can elicit any form of remorseful reaction. Theo considers how she would respond if she learned the truth in the last chapter. Even worse than the shock or repulsion, or possibly even fear in Ruth's eyes as I told her would be the look of sadness, disappointment and self-reproach. In the meanwhile, Theo's father has passed away, and his mother is in a nursing facility. One year ago, Theo and Kathy relocated to Surrey, returning to his boyhood home. They intended to refurbish the house and make it their own, but they haven't been able to do so. Theo's own inner tragedy, his inability to escape his own childhood trauma, is reflected in this geographical detail. Alicia was unable to escape her own influence. While Theo believed he'd gotten away for a while, he hasn't. He exhibited aggressive conduct akin to his father's and has now returned to his boyhood home in Surrey, at least in terms of geography. As a result, the novel's climax emphasizes an overarching lesson wrapped in its mental health theme, the dangers of ignoring to confront psychiatric illnesses. Trauma may be treated, but it must first be addressed, recognized, and communicated in some way. Failure to follow these actions causes the trauma to fester, potentially leading to self-destruction, as seen in both Theo's and Alicia's situations. Character Analysis Theo Faber The narrator of the novel Theo Faber introduces himself as follows. My name is Theo Faber. I'm a 42-year-old woman. And since I was messed up, I became a psychotherapist. Theo grew up with his mother and violent father in Surrey, just outside of London. He thought he was free when he left home at the age of 18 to attend university. He did, however, suffer from mental health concerns as a result of internalizing his father's physical and emotional abuse. I was pursued by an infernal, relentless chorus of furies, all with his voice, shrieking that I was worthless, shameful and a failure, 19. He began treatment after a failed suicide attempt. Ruth, Theo's therapist, assisted him in talking therapy. The sounds in his brain faded away. Theo is a seasoned psychotherapist by the time the novel's plot begins. Theo is hallucinating. I was fucked up, he adds, yet he's still disturbed. He thinks he's beyond his tragic childhood but it still haunts him. He believes he is rescuing Alicia but he actually ends up ruining her. He thinks he's gotten away from his violent father's destiny, but he ends up in Surrey, like his father, living in his old house with a miserable woman in a loveless marriage. Despite the fact that he has not murdered anybody with his bare hands, he has demonstrated that, like his father, he is an emotionally and physically violent individual. Theo's constant smoking is a striking character feature, revealing both his mental health concerns and his deluded nature. Theo is ashamed of his smoking and attempts to disguise it, but he appears to be succeeding. However, towards the conclusion of the book, it's evident that he never fooled anyone, let alone Alicia. This final point is particularly concerning to Theo since Alicia has been pointing out a weakness in him all along, undercutting his godlike role as the doctor who rescues the patient. Alicia Berenson The novel's silent protagonist is Alicia Berenson. The plot is driven by her deeds, which begin with the murder of Gabriel. Alicia is 39 years old when the story begins. She had slain her spouse when she was 33 years old, six years before. She hasn't said anything since then. Instead of sending her to prison for the murder, the court declared her unstable and confined her to the mental facility The Grove. 
Alicia hasn't spoken in six years, and her silence evokes the Greek goddess Alcestis, who gives up her own life to save her husband. Alicia evidently relates with the persona, as evidenced by the fact that she named her self-portrait after her. Vernon's psychic infanticide of Alicia, as well as Gabriel's choice of his own life above Alicia's, both play a role in Alicia's association with Alcestis. Alicia is Alcestis, silent with wrath and pain at the betrayal of the men who should have loved and protected her. The importance of nonverbal communication is emphasized by Alicia's character. The fact that Alicia doesn't talk adds to the significance of her deeds. Despite the fact that she is silent for most of the story, her journal acts as her voice, providing insights into her thoughts and personality. Her drawings serve as a way of expression as well. She handles her relationships with Eva, Lydia Gabriel, and finally Theo, via her writing. Catherine Kathy Kathy, Theo's wife, is having an affair with Gabriel, Alicia's husband. She is an actress in her late 30s or early 40s. Kathy was born in the United States, although her mother was born in England. Kathy is the polar opposite of Alicia, bold, confident, and vocal, providing a juxtaposition to the insane, silent patient. Kathy did that a lot, protesting her insanity. I'm crazy, I'm nuts, I'm insane, but I never believed her. She smiled far too readily and frequently for me to think she had gone through what I had. Kathy becomes a shell of her former self after Gabriel's death, meek and withdrawn. Theo idolizes Kathy as someone who rescued him, just like Alicia seemed to have admired Gabriel. On their first night together, he depicts her as a Greek goddess come to life. Kathy's love for Theo demonstrates that he is deserving of love, something his parents never taught him, and that he has overcome his early trauma to attain normalcy, replete with a successful personal romantic relationship. The discovery of Kathy's treachery, therefore, shatters not just Theo's marriage illusions, but also his sense of self-worth. Gabriel Berenson Gabriel, Alicia's husband, is having an affair with Kathy, Theo's wife. Gabriel is murdered at the age of 44, six years before the plot of the novel begins. He also made a living as a photographer. Gabriel is shown as the sensible rock in Alicia's journal writings, in contrast to her psychotic self. Gabriel is the one who proposes she start writing. In this case, he is the problem solver, offering a proactive solution in the face of Alicia's wallowing. The reader is also introduced to two images that confirm the couple's sane versus insane dynamic. Alicia's self-portrait, which shows her naked and vulnerable, and her portrait of Jesus with Gabriel's face, aligning Gabriel with a religious leader. Not just in the Jesus picture, but also in Gabriel's name, there is a religious connotation. One of the archangels, Gabriel, is a celestial messenger who announced the birth of Jesus to Mary. Gabriel, in Theo's opinion, is a cool person, possibly a little too cool. Gabriel's photography is described by Theo as slick and shallow, with images of semi-starved, semi-naked women at strange, unflattering angles. Gabriel was still living the life of a stylish, successful fashion photographer on the day of his death, photographing models for Vogue magazine in London's chic Shoreditch district. Gabriel is full of himself too, according to Jean Felix. Max Berenson Gabriel's adopted brother Max is Alicia's solicitor. Although Max says that Gabriel was always the star of the two siblings, he and Gabriel were close. When Theo visits Max, he learns that he despises Alicia. Max was in love with Alicia, as the reader and Theo will discover, though Alicia comments in her diary that Max is probably simply envious of Gabriel and wants what Gabriel has. The reader has a fleeting suspicion that Max was involved in Gabriel's death. Alicia feels for a brief second that Max is her stalker for example, and Theo explains that Gabriel will be left everything to Max. These turn out to be red herrings, and Max eventually reveals that he had a true affection for Alicia when he learns of her coma at the Grove. Eva and Vernon The Parents of Alicia When Alicia was a youngster, Eva murdered herself by driving her car into a wall while Alicia was inside. Alicia was terrified of having children, 
because of her mother's history of suicidal and murderous behavior. Vernon committed suicide a few years before the story begins, and Alicia tried suicide not long after. While Theo first concludes that Alicia must have adored her father, and that her suicide attempt was motivated by sadness, he soon discovers that Alicia despised him. Theo sees Vernon's wish for his daughter's death as Alicia's psychological death, a formative childhood experience that turned her against her father and made her capable of murdering a man, Gabriel. Paul Rose The cousin of Alicia Lydia, Vernon's sister, has a son. In terms of Alicia's formative childhood trauma, Paul gives the missing piece of the picture. Paul is Theo's age, and he represents what Theo may have been if he hadn't run away from his parents' house. Paul is an alcoholic and a gambler, enslaved by his cruel mother and still caring for her at his boyhood home. Lydia Rose Following her mother's death, Alicia was raised by her aunt. Lydia, another character who supports the issue of mental illness, is mentally sick. Lydia is abrasive and enraged, and she has a great disdain for Alicia, calling her a little bitch all her life. She claims that she looked after Alicia after Eva died, and that she was ungrateful, even painting an ugly image of Lydia which Lydia describes as an obscene mockery, 149. Professor Lazarus Diomedes Imperial College Professor of Forensic Psychiatry and Clinical Director of The Grove Lazarus looks nearly godlike in Theo's narration, similar to the gods who frequently affect the lives and situations of mortals in Greek dramas. Theo tells how Lazarus' testimony sways the judge and helps Alicia to avoid jail time at Alicia's trial. Lazarus also establishes the novel's narrative deadline, leaving Theo only six weeks to persuade Alicia to talk. The biblical connotations of the name Lazarus support a view that associates the figure with godlike or celestial creatures. Lazarus is a person in the New Testament who is resurrected from the grave by Jesus. Lazarus also acts as a surrogate father figure for Theo, who looks to the older man for acceptance that his own father could never deliver. Yuri The Grove's lead mental nurse Yuri arrived in England from Latvia seven years ago, exactly one year before Alicia assassinated Gabriel. When he first came, he didn't speak a word of English. He's now a native speaker. He comes across as nice and laid back, providing a contrast to Theo's compulsive and addiction-driven personality. Even Yuri has a bad side, as it is eventually found that he sells narcotics to clinic patients. Many personalities urge Theo against pursuing Alicia's case, including Yuri. Elif. At the Grove, there's yet another patient. She suffocated her mother and sister while they were sleeping. Her outspokenly assertive personality contrasts with Alicia's. On two occasions, Elif is the catalyst for Alicia's rages. First, Elif approaches Alicia in the canteen a few weeks after her admittance, asking if Gabriel deserved to die and what he looked like after someone shot him in the head. Alicia becomes enraged, breaks a dish, and uses the shards to slit Elif's throat. When Elif daubs the word slut on Alicia's artwork and claims that Theo is in love with her, she is once again an instigator. In reaction, Alicia uses a paintbrush to stab Elif in the eye. Tanya Max Berenson's wife and receptionist When Theo goes to meet Max, Tanya catches him for a brief time alone and recommends that if he wants to learn more about Alicia, he must see Paul, Alicia's cousin. Tanya is jittery and frightened of her spouse. Tanya's persona acts as a story device, informing the reader that Max's remarks about Alicia, which portrays her as a mentally ill lady with a violent background, should not be discarded lightly. Tanya has a little but significant role in the story, since her brief appearance in the narrative directs Theo's attention to Paul and adds to the mystery surrounding Alicia and Gabriel's connection. Christian West A psychiatrist at the Grove with whom Theo is familiar with a former job, and who Theo despises. Gabriel's old school classmate Christian is suspected of surreptitiously treating Alicia 
following Vernon's suicide, in exchange for a financial payment. In the weeks leading up to Gabriel's murder, he treated her similarly. Both Christian and Gabriel felt Alicia was hallucinating when she mentioned a stalker. Christian had prescribed antipsychotic medicine to Alicia at the time. His proclivity for medicating Alicia into a coma is a criticism of the overuse of medicines in mental health therapy. Theo's method, which involves digging into Alicia's previous trauma to find a fundamental cause, a reason for her transition into a killer, serves as a counterbalance. Jean Felix Martin The gallery manager represents Alicia as a painter. Originating in France The early 40s he and Alicia met when they were both in art school. He admires Alicia first and foremost as a painter, rather than as a person. While she was on trial, he presented her self-portrait, which drew large audiences. At the exhibition, Jean Felix shows Theo four of Alicia's paintings and encourages Theo to read the Euripides play from which Alcestis is derived. His character, like Tanya's, acts as a storied instrument supplying information and direction to Detective Theo that would aid in the unraveling of the mystery surrounding Alicia's silence and Gabriel's death. Jean Felix also advises Theo to provide Alicia with painting supplies, which she uses to make the painting of her and Theo in front of the grove as it burns. Ruth Theo's former therapist He went to see her for the first time after attempting suicide in his first year of university. Ruth helped Theo to speak up about his horrific background through talk therapy, and he credits her with his better mental health. Ruth, who is no longer Theo's therapist, remains a comforting character in his mind, perhaps even a replacement mother figure, bringing comfort and direction in a manner that his own mother could not. When Theo learns of Kathy's infidelity, he looks to Ruth for help. Theo considers how she would respond if she learned the truth in the last chapter even worse than the shock or repulsion, or possibly even fear in Ruth's eyes as I told her would be the look of sadness, disappointment, and self-reproach. Mother and Father of Theo The tale merely makes a passing reference to Theo's parents. His father has died, and his mother is in a nursing home at the time the story is set. His father was abusive, and Theo suffered from low self-esteem as a result. His mother was despondent, and he had no one to shield him from his father. Theo considers his ability to escape his parents' clutches a victory. When he and Kathy get engaged, he invites her to their Surrey home for a visit, hoping to show them that he's made it, that he's lived a regular life with intimacy. By the end of the tale, he has moved back to Surrey with Kathy, even living in his old house. Andira Sharma At the Grove, there is a psychiatrist. Indira is a kind presence who reminds Theo of his last therapist, Ruth. She does motherly tasks such as preparing cakes, and Theo characterizes her as having a maternal calm. Indira has a motherly affection for Alicia and Theo, and is a strong supporter of their relationship. When Alicia initially assaults Theo, she frames the exchange favorably by remarking, in a way Alicia has begun to talk. Her advocate, Theo, is the conduit through which she communicates. It's already taking place. Barbie Hellman Barbie, who lived next door to Alicia and Gabriel at the time of the murder, still pays Alicia a visit at the Grove every couple of months. Barbie touts herself as Alicia's excellent friend and confidant, yet she is a narcissist who only speaks about herself. On one occasion, Alicia confided in Barbie, informing her about her stalker. She also gives Barbie a blurry snapshot of the man who is following her. Barbie tells the cops about Alicia's suspicions and the photo during the inquiry into Gabriel's death. Stephanie Clark The Grove's new manager has arrived just in time for Theo to start working there. She is conscientious and careful. Stephanie wants Theo to immediately cease working with her, after Alicia assaults him during their first therapy session. Stephanie's character serves as a physical embodiment of the threat that hangs over the grove, namely that the trust will cut funding and shut the institution down. This possibility, 
coupled with Stephanie's desire to put a stop to Theo's work with Alicia, adds an element of pressure to the novel, upping the suspense with a deadline that makes Theo feel like he has to beat the clock. Themes The risks of unresolved mental illness or improper treatment The silent patient's overarching story and the stories of many of the characters show the risks of unresolved or badly managed mental illness. Alicia's trauma from Vernon's devastating statement, which mentally killed her, was evidently never addressed. Theo's assault on Alicia and Gabriel was therefore able to revive this trauma with fatal consequences. Theo too has unresolved issues from his violent background, which contribute to his emotional relationship with Kathy, which causes him to be unable to leave her after uncovering her infidelity, again with disastrous consequences for himself and others. Theo's father, who he feels had an undiagnosed personality problem, and Alicia's mother, Eva, who likely suffered from mental health difficulties that led to her suicide, and or Alicia's attempted murder, the novel never makes her aim clear. Even secondary characters battle with mental health concerns, which is highlighted by the novel's location of the Grove Medical Institution and Theo's occupation. For example, the aggressive patient Elif, as well as the nurse Yuri, describes to Theo a history of disturbing stalker behavior. The story illustrates the universality of mental health difficulties by presenting individuals on both ends of the spectrum, patient versus caregiver, doctor, nurse. In Christian's reply to Theo, the hazy boundary between patient caregiver and mentally unstable stable reappears. She's the patient you know, not you. The nurse's station at the Grove is also described as blurring the borders between patient and caregiver. The patients hovered restlessly outside, staring in, watching us, so we were the ones under constant observation. Mental health issues and the best ways to treat them are also discussed. When Christian treats Alicia privately, for example, he prescribes antipsychotics. What if the doctor had opted for talk therapy, instead? Is it possible that Gabriel's death might have been avoided? Then there's Theo's final thought about Kathy, which reveals his preferred treatment method. Her doctor wanted to put her on antidepressants but I strongly advised against it. I advised her to see a therapist and talk about her thoughts. Kathy, on the other hand, appears to be unwilling to speak. Betrayal's Constructive Force One of the novel's central themes is betrayal. Vernon's psychological betrayal of his daughter, Alicia, by wishing her death, sows the seed of her childhood anguish. Following Kathy's betrayal of Theo, he begins stalking Alicia and Gabriel. Finally, Gabriel's betrayal of Alicia results in Alicia's breakdown and Gabriel's death when he chooses his life over hers. Other betrayals might be found on a smaller scale throughout the pages. By longing after Alicia, Max betrays his brother and his wife. By transferring galleries, Alicia undermines Jean Felix professionally. By falling in love with and pursuing and finally approaching another lady, Yuri emotionally betrays his wife. Years ago, even Theo and Kathy began their romance by sleeping together, thereby betraying their partners. The tale demonstrates that treachery may occur in a variety of situations, from friendship to business. The most dangerous betrayal, on the other hand, happens in love. Throughout the story, betrayal and envy are tightly linked. There's Theo's envy of Gabriel, but there's also Max's envy of Gabriel. Like betrayal, jealousy may lead to irrational and dangerous behavior. For example, Alicia claims that Max is only interested in her because he is envious of Gabriel. The human instinct to hide weakness and present the world with a favorable facade. The issue of mental health is inextricably tied to the human drive to maintain a positive public image or keep up appearances. Mental illness is frequently stigmatized. Gabriel's desire that Alicia has private, off-the-record therapy is evidence of this in the novel. It's also evident in Theo's attempt to conceal his smoking, which he fears is a sign of unresolved psychological issues. Even when it comes to Kathy, his personal girlfriend, Theo feels compelled to put on a show, concealing his marijuana usage because he knows she would disapprove. 
The story claims that those who hide behind the facade of everything is fine end up hurting themselves and maybe others. It is simpler for Theo to preserve the appearance of a functional relationship than it is for him to leave Kathy. Perhaps the issue would not have spiraled out of hand as it did, culminating in stalking, assault and murder, if he had just stopped the marriage. The need to put on a brave face in front of the world reflects the human drive to disguise vulnerability for the sake of self-preservation. Injured animals may try to conceal their condition, since predators are more likely to pounce if they detect weakness. Theo needs to feel in command, like he's the god doctor saving Alicia's mortal patient. Theo is mortified when Alicia admits that she has known he smokes all along. She has discovered a vulnerability in him, which has thrown their power dynamic of doctor-patient and stable-unstable into disarray. Symbols and Motifs Alcestis Euripides's play Alcestis is a major symbol in the silent patient, and it manifests itself in a variety of ways. Alcestis' figure is a vivid depiction of Alicia herself. When their husbands prioritize their own lives over their wives, both ladies are betrayed. Alicia's use of the word Alcestis to sign her self-portrait demonstrates her understanding of its symbolic significance. Alcestis represents the silent patient, the scorned woman and the deceived individual. She is deafeningly quiet, but her silence sends a message of disappointment, anger and wrath. In this way, she exemplifies the importance of nonverbal communication, demonstrating the saying that sometimes a person talks loudly when they don't say anything at all. Alcestis is not just the name of the character, but also the title of the play that Alicia and Jean Felix attend and which Theo reads. But why does she not speak, asks the epigraph of the silent patient, a passage from the play. In light of the topic of betrayal, the tragedy itself is symbolically significant. The novel closely identifies itself with the tradition of tragedy, full of murders, suicides, and mistaken identities, all pillars of many a tragic work, by crafting a narrative around Alcestis, the lady, the self-portrait, and the story itself. Drama, Theater The play Alcestis isn't the only one mentioned in the text. There are various references to theatrical works in The Silent Patient. Kathy is an actress who is currently practicing for a play of Othello, a tragedy that culminates in murder and suicide. Lazarus refers to William Congreve's The Morning Bride, another tragedy that ends in suicide by mistake. Part 3 opens with a Shakespeare quotation from The Winter's Tale, which is classified as a problem play, in terms of classification, since the first two acts are a psychological drama and the latter two acts have a humorous happy ending. These allude to a fundamental issue in the novel, the human urge to show a specific face to the world, which is sometimes a false one. People put on a mask and put on an act, such as Theo's performance for Kathy, which makes it seem like everything is okay. These references also serve as foreshadowing devices. Take the example of Othello. Othello strangles his wife Desdemona to death in this play, mistaking her for an adulteress. Othello kills himself after understanding Desdemona's innocence. He stabs another man, Iago, to death, blaming him for the mistake. This illusion so foreshadows the novel's violence, which is triggered by Theo's jealousy. Kathy is practicing for the role of Desdemona, and Theo wonders briefly whether her steamy letters with her boyfriend were part of her preparation, rehearsing a character, until he notices that she signed the emails Kathy rather than Desdemona. Alicia's Paintings Throughout the story, several individuals debate a variety of Alicia's paintings, each one offering insight into Alicia's relationships. Her art's significance demonstrates the importance of nonverbal communication. The Alcestis self-portrait, painted a few days after Gabriel's death, is the first artwork the story focuses on. Alicia is seen naked, implying her vulnerability, and clutching a red dripping paintbrush, implying the brutality that has just occurred. Later, as Theo analyzes the image more attentively, he discovers a shadowy presence in the backdrop, a guy hiding. He also realizes that the red apple dish 
is covered with little white maggots. These nefarious details provide insight into Alicia's mental state, as well as how she utilizes her artwork to communicate non-verbally, displaying her stalker to the world, despite the fact that she does not inform the public about the stalker vocally. At the exhibition, Jean Felix shows Theo three more of Alicia's works. The first is Alicia's mother's death in a vehicle accident. The second is a picture of Jesus on the crucifixion, with Gabriel as Jesus. Lydia, Alicia's aunt, is shown in the third photo, extremely fat and naked on a sagging bed. Alicia's link to the individual depicted is evident in each case. Her mother is a phantom to her, and she idolizes Gabriel while hating Lydia. Finally, there's Alicia's painting of Theo and herself sprinting in front of the grove as it burns, implying the complexities of her relationship with Theo, who says, I couldn't tell if I was depicted in the act of rescuing Alicia or about to throw her into the flames. Theo destroys Alicia, but he also rescues her by discovering the source of her childhood trauma and forcing her to confront it and eventually getting her to communicate. Thank you. Condensed Books